اعوذ باللہ من الشیطان الرجیم بسم اللہ الرحمن الرحیم الحمد للہ رب العالمین باری الخلائق اجمعین والحمد للہ الذی بعد فلا یرا وقربا فشہد النجوى تبارک و تعالی والصلاة والسلام على اشرف الانبیاء والمرسلین حبیب قلوبنا و طبیب نفوسنا و شفیع ذنوبنا ابو القاسم محمد وعلى اہل بیته الطیبین الطاہرین المعصومین الذین اذهب اللہ عنہم الرجس و طاہرہم تطہیرا اما بعد سلام علیکم جمیعا و رحمت اللہ و برکاتہ وعلیکم سلام و رحمت اللہ I pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make us all amongst this award of Abu Abdullah al-Hussain and to give us the opportunity to perform his ziyarat insha'Allah ta'ala. As far as the etiquettes of ziyarat are concerned, I will encourage each and every one of us to read up on what these etiquettes are in terms of physical etiquettes, physical etiquettes of what to do, uh, what to recite before you leave from home, uh, what to say, uh, and what all those things are, are important for you to read up and discuss, and you will be able to find them in many books, in English, in Gujarati, in Kachi, in Urdu, in Farsi, in whatever language you want to read them. I do not wish to concentrate on how you present yourself physically before the Imam, nor do I want to concentrate on how... Uh, what you recite. I want to go to the core of the purpose of the visit to Abu Abdullah Hussein alayhi salatu was salam and there are so many narrations, so many ahadith uh, speaking about or talking about the excellence of performing the ziyarat of Hussein ibn Ali and you will see ample of them. The fact that we are sitting here to learn the etiquettes of the ziyarat in itself proves that we uh, have some understanding of the importance of the ziyarat of Abu Abdullah al-Hussein alayhi salatu was salam. So I will not concentrate on those anymore except during the Q&A session if one wishes me to elaborate on any particular etiquette then I will do so. I want you to observe one thing in particular that you and I are going to perform the ziyarat. What does ziyarat mean? What is the meaning of ziyarat? Ziyarat means to visit. That's all ziyarat means. Now there are etiquettes of visitation. When I come to your house, you come to my house, there are certain etiquettes of visitation. Does it mean that these are the etiquettes that you and I need to observe to go and perform the ziyarat of Abu Abdullah al Hussein, of the supreme uh, Imam? or whose ziyarat we are performing, whether it is the third imam or the fourth imam or the fifth imam or any other imam for that matter. Surely it doesn't mean how to present yourself before the imam. However, if somebody does feel that way, then yes, there are certain etiquettes that have been mentioned in Mafatih al-Jinan, in Kamil al-Ziyarat, in, in Iqbal and many other books which mention the physical etiquettes. But ziyarat means to visit, purely to visit. Uh, but it's a very empty meaning of the performance of the ziyarat of Hussein ibn Ali. Ziyarat requires a profound understanding of the personality of Abu Abdullah himself and the ma'rifa of his existence and the purpose of his mission. That is what makes the ziyarat. There is one hadith, for example, which says that you can perform this ziyarat from afar. You don't need to actually be there present in the haram of Imam alayhi salatu wasalam, And you will still be rewarded and you will be given thawab. So why take a trouble of going 4,000 kilometers, 5,000, 10,000 kilometers of miles to go and visit Abu Abdullah al-Hussein? You will not even be able to touch him. 
you will not even be able to see him, you will, only, you will only be pushed by the crowds there, you will only have to inconvenience yourself. Why should I actually go there if I am receiving the same kind of reward if I am performing the ziyarat from afar? So there is a purpose in the physical visitation of the ziyarat of Imam alayhi salatu wasalam, and that is what I want to concentrate on. What are we going to do there? And I want this to be interactive, perhaps even from now, and I, I don't have to then speak for 20-30 minutes, we can make it interactive now. Let's ask ourselves a question, why am I going to do ziyarat? Am I going to perform ziyarat because it is meritorious? There is huge amounts of merit in performing this ziyarat. Am I going to perform this ziyarat because I have a sick member of the family at home and I really want to go to Abu Abdullah Hussein and hold on to his zari and say to him that I want cure for this person who is sick. Am I going to perform this ziyarat because I have a desire that I want to be fulfilled and I am dying for this desire of mine to be fulfilled and therefore I am truly going to go there and hold the the Khaq of Karbala and say, here I am, please fulfill this. What is the purpose of my visitation? That is what requires. concentration should be on why I am going to perform Zerat. What is it? I, have to, I don't have it. Sorry. What is it that I am going to perform the Zerat for? Because the etiquettes of performing Zerat recite a hundred times Allahu Akbar before you leave home, uh, do your wasiyat and tell people what you... All these things are necessary uh, for your responsibility. Sorry. So the important question, and I'm not going to answer this question, of course, because if I answer this question, then the real purpose for why you are going to perform the ziyarat, I don't know. I don't know why you, you're going to perform the ziyarat, uh, and what should be the reason for, for performance of this ziyarat. So you ask yourself a question, only you know what made you make this intention of performing ziyarat. I just don't want you to go to perform this ziyarat because it is a trend to walk from Najaf to Karbala. Please, you will destroy every intention of yours if you are going because it is a trend to walk from Karbala, from Najaf to Karbala and because everybody is going to walk and so I am also going to walk. I don't want you to say, Labbayka ya Hussein without you knowing what you are saying. What if Imam Hussein says, yeah, here I am now, what, what is it you want? How are you going to respond to this Labbayk Ya Hussein? I don't want you to go and perform this ziyarat, or I don't want to go and perform this ziyarat without any kind of ma'rifa whatsoever. The first question that you need to answer, those zawar, those who are intending to perform this ziyarat is, why am I going to perform this ziyarat? What is it? that has led me or that has attracted me or that has inspired me to perform this particular ziyarat. So this is a lead that I am leaving with you. When you are there, insha'Allah ta'ala, the scholars who are with you, 
the guides who are with you will guide you, will, will tell you what you are supposed to do. You will have read, you will have read about Jabir ibn Abdullah al-Ansari's, we had a beautiful marthiyah today. You will hear about Jabir's ziyarat and why he, all these things you will hear. But while you are there, there are many people who get very busy and engrossed in some superficial understanding and superficial activities of performance of ziyarat. I am using the word superficial deliberately because I feel that if somebody understood the true meaning of the performance of ziyarat, they would not behave in a particular way. Let me give you an example. Touching of the zari will give in our understanding, it gives us barakat. We want there, we want to go and touch the zari and we will get barakat. So you will see people whose back is hurting, for example, or they have back problem. The first thing they want to do is get as close to the zari as possible. And the moment they have access to it, they want to put their back by the zari and make sure that the 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 the, the zari is touching their back so they get shafa from it. Some have problem with their heads, and therefore they will bang their heads there. Some, whatever it is, it is, it is, it is a belief that I, through the barakat of this particular place, am receiving this. And surely it is Abu Abdullah's uh, uh, grave. There is no doubt that the the intercession and intervention from him is 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 great. Fitrus, an angel received it. Uh, so if an angel was in need of, of that particular barakat, then surely you and I, but, but. There is a verse in Quran, when you are there, I want you to reflect on this. There is a verse in Quran which says, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, وَلَا تَحْسَبَنَّ الَّذِينَ قُتِلُوا فِي سَبِيلِ اللَّهِ أَمْوَاتًا بَلْ أَحْيَاءٌ عِنْدَ رَبِّهِمْ يُرْزَقُونَ Never consider those slain in the way of Allah to be dead. They are not dead. They are alive and receive their sustenance from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I repeat the verse again. Never consider those slain in the way of Allah to be dead. They are alive. And are receiving their sustenance from their Lord. In normal fiqh, normal fiqh that we study, it is not wajib to say salamun alaykum. It isn't. But it is wajib to respond to the salam. So when I say salamun alaykum, I'm not saying it. But if I'm saying salamun alaykum, it is wajib for you to respond. It is known as wajib kifai which means if one of the crowd says alaykum salam, it is saqit on the others. The others are exempt from saying it. This includes the importance of salam is such that if somebody is praying salat wajib, wajib prayers, and you enter the house or you enter the mosque where a wajib namaz is being prayed and somebody says salamun alaykum, then the person who is praying a wajib prayer, if no one has responded, it is wajib for him to respond in kind. Exactly the same way, not alaykum salam, but respond by saying salamun alaykum. This is the importance of response to salamun alaykum. Is it conceivable therefore, that when I go to perform the ziyarat of Hussein ibn Ali, and I'm told by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in Quran that they, those slain in the way of Allah are alive and they are not dead. Is it conceivable therefore that I say, Assalamu alayka ya Aba Abdullah and he does not respond to me? Is it possible? But why is it that I cannot hear his alaykum salam? Why is it that I can't hear the response of Hussein ibn Ali? some points or a point for you and I to reflect upon. Those slain in the way of Allah are alive. I am not going to kiss the grave. I am not going to touch the grave. I am going to communicate with the master of the liberated people. 
I am going to meet Hussein, the grandson of the Holy Prophet of Islam. I am going to speak to him. I am going to talk to him. <coughs> I am not just going to touch the zari and come back. No, I want to communicate with my master. I want to know more about him. I want to understand what is the purpose of my existence. I want to know from him how he perceived this universe. I want to know from him how I should perceive this universe. How will I do this? Not by pushing people to kiss the zari, but by sitting outside there, looking at his zari, contemplating, talking to him, seeking his permission to enter. أَأَدْخُلُ ya Aba Abdullah. Do you allow me to enter this haram? And if the ears are open, and the soul is purified, there is no way that you cannot hear the response that you now may enter. What is the philosophy of Isna Dukhul? You don't seek permission when you go inside to, to the graveyard, do you? You just say, Assalamu alaikum, ya ahl al qubur, antum lana faratun wa nahnu insha'Allahu bikum lahiqoon. Or the inhabitants of the grave, you have preceded us. We are insha'Allah going to join you. That's the dua you will recite when you go to the Qabrastan. Or you say, Assalamu ala ahli la ilaha illallah, ya ahli la ilaha illallah, min la ilaha illallah, kayfa wajattum qawla la. That's all we say. You don't go in there to communicate with the people who are, who are uh, in the graveyard. What do you go to the graveyard for? What is the purpose of going to the graveyard? The purpose of going to the graveyard is to remember our dead people. But when you are going there, it is not a graveyard that you and I are visiting. The Ibn Dukhul, the philosophy of seeking permission to enter means that you can't enter without seeking permission. It also means that seeking permission means you are asking permission from the Imam والسلام, and you are expecting a response from him. So what needs to be done in preparation is purification of the soul to allow my ears to hear that which I normally don't listen to. To keep my eyes open to that which I do not keep my eyes open to, to keep my heart open. And I'm not talking about the eyes, the, the physical eyes. No, I am speaking about the eye of the heart. Because if this, there is a verse in Quran which says, مَنْ أَعْمَى فِي هَذِهِ الدُّنْيَا وَهُوَ فِي الْآخِرَةِ أَعْمَى One who is blind in this world is going to be blind in the next world as well. This is a verse of Quran. Allah says, one who is blind in this world is going to be blind in the next world. If I, take, if I take the literal meaning of this, it means the blind man who is blind will not be able to see even in the hereafter. But that's a very superficial meaning of it. It means that one who has not been able to see the fact and the truth and the reality in this world will not be able to see the reality in the hereafter as well. If I am unable to understand this philosophy of of, of my master's ziyarat and the visitation. I'm seeking permission. My ears, I need to prepare them from here to go and open my ears so that I may be able to speak to my master when he responds to me, when he says alaykum salam to me. Maybe we will not be able to achieve this. Maybe it's difficult to achieve this. It is still a start. We require to perform a spiritual ziyarat not a ziyarat of trend. People are just because it's a trend to perform a ziyarat and therefore I am also one of the people who is following a trend. Another thing that I want you to contemplate about ziyarat and then I will end inshaAllah ta'ala and open for question and answer. The story of Fitrus. You may have heard it. You may not have heard the story of Fitrus. Some people even deny the they consider it to be da'if, they consider it to be weak, some people do not even believe in it. But I want to use this story to be able to understand my ziyarat, my own ziyarat. The story of Fitrus goes like this. Upon the birth of Abu Abdullah al Hussein sallallahu wa sallam, when he was uh, born, 
Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the riwayat says, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent 70,000 angels along with Jibreel Amin to congratulate the Holy Prophet of Islam upon the birth of Hussein ibn Ali. This hadith or this riwayat lays emphasis on who is Hussein and what is the status of Hussein. As Jibreel Amin was leading the caravan of the angels, to go and pay a visit to the Holy Prophet of Islam so that they can congratulate him, they came across an island where there was an angel who was um, punished by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and was isolated from the assembly of the angels because this angel was lazy in obeying the command. Not that he did not obey the command, but he showed some kind of a lethargic attitude. This is what the riwayat says. Again, I emphasize, I am not concentrating on the riwayat. I am concentrating on what I want to take out of this particular story for the Zawar in particular. And this uh, Fitrus saw Jibreel Amin and he saw the rest of the angels visiting uh, the Holy Prophet. He inquired and he was told by Jibreel that this is where we are going. He asked permission if he was also going to be allowed so that he can also come and congratulate the Holy Prophet of Islam upon the birth of Hussein. Allah granted the permission. Fitrus was carried together with them and he was placed before Imam Hussein alayhi salatu wasalam as they went to give um, their congratulations and greetings. It is said according to the riwayat that at that moment Fitrus complained and sought the intercession of the Holy Prophet of Islam so that he could be forgiven for whatever crime he had committed. The Prophet is said to have told Jibreel to ask Fitrus to come and touch his body with the body of Hussein. Some go and say to touch the the cradle, but I don't think it was the cradle, it is to touch the body of Hussein. Fitrus moves forward, he touches his body with the body of Hussein ibn Ali, he is cured of his spiritual illness, and then he, he moves away from there, extremely rejoicing at this freedom, and he goes amongst the assembly of the angels, boasting amongst them, crying out, screaming, Is there anyone who has been liberated and freed like me by Abu Abdullah al-Hussein? You've heard this before? You've heard this story before. I want to use this story. Fitrus was Fitrus. I am also wanting to be Fitrus. I am Marid spiritually. I am sick. I have committed so many sins in my life. I am not even worth visiting the threshold of Abu Abdullah Hussein. I am ill spiritually. I am totally finished spiritually. I need the touch of Hussein to release me from my illness. I need Hussein to touch me. I need Hussein to kiss me. I need to kiss Hussein. I need him to give me the chifa spiritually so that I may be able to see him. I may be able to engage in communication with him so that I can be liberated. That ziyarat will have a different meaning altogether, but it will require reflection. It will require for me to sit outside, not just like a parrot. Assalamu alaikum ya waritha al masifatillah. Assalamu alaikum ya waritha nuhin nabiyillah. And the ziyarat is finished and we have come back. That ziyarat is not a ziyarat. Ziyarat requires total contemplation. It requires for me to understand who Hussein is. What can I take from Hussein? How do I apply what Hussein has done to my life? And when I come back, I am one of those people who have been liberated. You know, one of the names of Imam Hussein is Abu al-Ahrar, the father of the free and liberated people. Where does he get this name from? Because he is the one who grants freedom to people who are seekers of freedom. So Hussein ibn Ali is a huge personality. We may never be able to understand him. But the purpose of this visitation, as you walk from Karbala to 
from Najaf to Karbala or from wherever you are walking to Karbala or you are not walking, you are going by bus or by train or whatever you are going by. That is not, the people who walk are not walking because it's, because they just want to walk for the, for the sake of it. It is the sunnah of the ulama. There is no imam that has walked, but it is the sunnah of the ulama, maraji idham of the, of the past and present, uh, never used to perform the ziyarat on, on a mount or in a car or, 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 or in any transportation. They used to prefer walking and they used to go, even if they went once a month or twice a month. Ayatollah Shahabuddin Maraishi Najafi swore, you know Ayatollah Shahabuddin Maraishi Najafi, very spiritual uh, scholar who died very recently in Qom. He was so spiritual before Ayatollah Bahjad. He was so spiritual, so spiritual that that when he walked outside his house to go and lead the prayers in the mosque, in the haram, in Qom, the people used to flood the streets only to get a glimpse of him and kiss him. And he used to hold a stick in his hand, driving people away from him so that they don't kiss him. So spiritual. He has, writ he has the largest Shiite library in Qom, belongs to him. It's, the, it's he who has who has made this library. He himself is buried in this library. If you open, if you take any book in that library, and open the first page, there are certain notes that have been written. In one of the notes that I read, in one of the books, it says, it was impossible for me to buy this book. So I went to somebody whose family, somebody had died, and I told them, is there any kaza, namaz, or roza for the marhum? I am willing to do the namaz and the Kaza Rosas for him for this particular price so that I may be able to buy this book. And I bought this book through that money. That kind of a spiritual man. When he was in Najaf, he did not perform his ziyarat except if he walked to perform the ziyarat of Abu Abdullah. That is the ziyarat of Ma'rifah. He knew who he was going to visit. And when he was unable to walk, he stopped performing the ziyarat. He says, I will not go to perform the ziyarat in Karbala. I will do this ziyarat until he died. He never went back to Karbala. He performed the ziyarat from far. <coughs> Did he not know the importance of the ziyarat in Karbala? He knew. But his ziyarat had now reached that level where his soul was communicating with the soul of Imam. It was not his body that was communicating with the body of the Imam. It was his soul that is not restricted to time or space. You can then say, Assalamu alaikum ya Abu Abdullah from wherever if you are able to listen to the response of your master. So these are the important preparations that you and I need to perform as we go and perform the ziyarat. I will end here and open it for a question and answer session and then probably talk about specific um, issues that, 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 that are raised by this. Wassalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Unfortunately, I'm having a few technical issues. Alhamdulillah, um, is there any last minute entries I would like to put my name for the next trip? It's not just how, you know, Mulana puts it, but just going to Karbala and thinking about, you know, imagining yourself there is just you want to go again and again, alhamdulillah. So, this is the uh, point, we'll, we'll open it up to the floor. We do have just one mic, I'm going to keep it with uh, Mulana, and uh, I just ask that you ask your question loudly, just raise your hand, ask your question uh, very loudly so that um, everyone can hear, and uh, I'll ask you, uh, Mulana, to just repeat the question for those of you in this online, and then we'll have this recorded so it'll be beneficial for those as well. Okay, so uh, with that... Alaikum uh, salam. What should one's uh, attitude be when uh, going to Karbala and uh, also the other Imams? Because uh, emotionally, you're very happy, you're very excited. It's a great honor. So, does the Imam want to see us in a state of happiness, or does the Imam Hussein want to see us in a, sa in a state of sadness? And then also, when you go to, for example, Najaf or Kadamein, uh, maybe the level of grief is not that uh, pertinent in those cities. So, similarly, does Imam Ali want to see us with a big smile? 
should we re be recollecting the times of joy in his life, or should we address him with tears, uh, recollecting the time of uh, oppression in his life? So I I hope you heard the question. It was a long question. I can't <laughs> summarize. <laughs> yeah. Um, what should be our attitude in our visitations to our imams, be it Imam Hussein or any other imam for that matter? Should we be entering and reflecting upon the happy moments of their lives and go with a big smile? Or should we be going there? Please correct me if I am if I'm not uh, expressing your, your sentiments. Um, or should we be going there with a sad face and, and, and just do what we are supposed to be doing? Is that correct? It is important that prior to performance of the ziyarat that we reflect and we think about why we are going to perform this ziyarat. There is absolutely no problems in going with a big smile. It totally depends upon your relationship after your comprehension and understanding of the personality of the person, of the, of the personality you are visiting. So one of the trips, I had a young man from Sweden who came to perform ziyarat in the group in which we went together. Upon arrival in Karbala, we spoke about the etiquettes of how to enter the haram. We opened Sheikh Abbas Qummi's Mafatih al Jinan. We explained to them what uh, Sheikh Abbas Qummi says, what are the etiquettes of entering, how you need to take the dust of Karbala and place it on your head and walk barefooted, and all those etiquettes we explained to him. This young man heard me and was totally glued to what I was saying extremely concentrating. That night, when we went to Ziyarat, he didn't come with us. And he says, I need some time. Following day, he didn't go. Third day, he came with us. And now we have only one more day in Karbala. He came with us and he stood outside the haram and did not, in the sahan of the haram, and he did not go inside. And then he sat me down and said, I need to discuss this with you, Sayyid. It's the first time I have come to Ziyarat. And I have a very different view of my Imam. I have a very different impression. And my perception about my Imam is very different. I don't feel like going the way you have explained me to go. I feel I'm going to meet a huge Grand Master. And I want to be able to go with a three-piece suit. And I want to be able to enter there in his presence and feel the awe from there. I don't want to go there with dirty clothes because I want to meet my master. I was so touched by what he said because these etiquettes, sometimes we just follow them. Sheikh Abbas Kummi has explained them to us so that we can probably connect to the emotional side of Karbala. Probably that is why these things have been mentioned to us. But when you have a perception of your Imam, it does not matter how you enter. What matters is that you enter with presence, cognizant of the fact that his presence is intense before you and how you react to it. So it doesn't matter how you go. If you don't feel like crying, don't make your face to just cry. Truly, sincerely, and I swear to God, when you understand what Hussein is and what he does, not his emotional side of it, but only himself as a human being, you will not, but floods will, will come out of our eyes to know what Hussein ibn Ali is. Or anybody, or any imam that we go to. But it is the personal relationship, contemplation prior to, to going to this place, that... Uh, will establish this relationship of yours. Meet him soul to soul. Make it a point to, to make your soul meet his soul. And then perform the ziyarat of Abu Abdullah al I know you all have a lot of questions. So they don't, they shy, don't. Just, this is your chance to... They don't have questions. Don't push them. <laughs> the 
I'll ask a question. I'll give you a chance. I'm going to ask a question. Uh, my question is about uh, one of the uh, riwayat that says you shouldn't eat meat in uh, Karbala. Me and my wife talked about this for a long time. And, uh, you know, I... What is the philosophy? All right. <clears throat> so, it's not a hadith from what I understand. It's not a hadith from the imam or anything. It is, <coughs> it is one of the etiquettes that have been mentioned in the book that you should avoid eating meat in Karbala. Meat is considered to be um, an expensive dish and, um, and what, what is the purpose of writing this or the purpose of, of preventing people from eating meat is only that you, if you are going to, to, to give condolence to Bibi Fatima Zahra alayhi salam in Karbala and you are going to um, see Karbala as only an emotional aspect of, of Imam Hussein's life, then you know you should go with that kind of an etiquette, you should not merry make there, you should not laugh there, you should not joke there. It's just like you are visiting a, a bereaved family um, and therefore you should not be eating that which is a good food. But this is again very superficial as I said, very superficial. When you do that kind of a ziyarat, then yes. But when you are doing ziyarat at a different level altogether, uh, what do you think the people in Karbala are doing? Not eating meat? They will be deprived of, 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 uh, of protein. Uh, it will be a problem for them. The people in Karbala are eating meat. Our groups, when they go, there is nothing on the table but meat. Huge pieces of meat when, when you go and perform ziyarat. It's all there. Um, it's not important not to eat meat or to eat meat. It is just how you feel at that particular time. If you feel that you want to rejoice with the Imam, eat those big pieces of meat. If you feel that you are only there because you want to see this as a bereaved family and you want to feel sorry about it, or you, then avoid eating meat. But it's got nothing to do with the ziyarat itself. G. Okay, normally we go to Ziyarat to Syria, Iran, or So if I have an opportunity to go to one place, what should be my priority? So normally we go to Ziyarat, G. Yeah, that's what I'm doing. So the question is, normally we go to Ziyarat, <coughs> Syria, Iran, and Iraq. Medina you forgot as well. So, <laughs> and Medina. <coughs> If I want to perform ziyarat, what should be my priority of the performance of ziyarat? This is a tough question. <clears throat> it is your preference, to be quite honest, but the highest spiritual position in the eyes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and within the Muslim ummah is that of the Holy Prophet of Islam. He holds the highest position amongst all the infallibles, prophets, uh, and the Imams. The second highest position in the spiritual realm is that of Imam Ali salam, and the third highest status is of Bibi Fatima Zahra and then comes Imam Hussein alayhi salatu wasalam. So this is the spiritual status, I am talking about the spiritual status. However you from childhood as you listen to history and you go through books, you normally begin to develop um, love for a particular personality uh, amongst this personality. Uh, and at times it is so intense that you 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 are attracted and want to want to go towards that particular personality, whatever it is. But the the excellencies of the ziyarat of Hussein ibn Ali are so many, so many uh, that, including one riwayat that says, if you have already performed Hajj. Uh, <coughs> then on the day of Arafat you should be performing the ziyarat of Imam Hussein alayhi salatu wasalam because the rahmah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala first looks towards Karbala and then it looks towards Arafat. There is a, 
hadith that suggests that. So it's yeah, it's how you want to perform, where you, your heart is being attracted. There is no specific, uh, <clears throat> but the philosophy of Ziyarat actually started in the way it is now after the martyrdom of Imam Hussein alayhi salatu wasalam. So it is he who has saved the legacy of all the prophets. It is he who has saved the legacy of the Holy Prophet of Islam and the teachings of him. And therefore he is seen to be, had it not been him, all these things would not have existed and therefore people get pulled towards it. But Bibi Zainab is another huge personality, uh, the Prophet. So it doesn't matter whose ziyarat you do first. Yeah. <coughs> You see, as far as people are concerned, they follow what they are being told and that is why I insist that the self-reflection, self-development, self-growth through reflection is extremely important. Um, the reward is not in the walk. The reward is in the game, in the end, in the actual hadaf, in the actual prize that you are going to get. Could it be possible or is it the case that if I walk from Najaf to Karbala, I will get 1000 sawab and if I go by bus, I will get 10 sawab. Is, is there anywhere written like this? No. The only saying in Arabic language that people use is Al-Ajru ala qadril mashaqqa Which means that the reward is in accordance with the trouble that you take. But that, does, that is not restricted to the Zayrat of Imam Hussein only. It is restricted to life principle in itself. The more jetli menat, et lo far. That's what they say in Gujarati. That's what Al-Ajru ala qadril mashaqqa means in Arabic language. Uh, Yes, there, there, there is this inspiration, there is this zeal of people to perform, they want to go and perform the Ziyarat of Hussein, some of them want to feel the pain that Hussein ibn Ali went through. That is why in the beginning I say, don't go and perform the Ziyarat because it is a trend. Walk because you really feel that you want to humiliate yourself, you want to have dust on you to be able to visit. I don't know what the intention of the people who are walking is, but once you have the ma'rifah, like we are told regarding Janabi Zainab alayhi salam, we are told that when she came from Sham after, after coming from the prison uh, and she came to Karbala, she threw herself from the from the mahmil, from the camel, outside the outskirts of Karbala. And then she walked on her knees to the grave of Imam Hussein alayhi salatu wasalam. We are told that that is what has happened. We have a maqam of Imam Jafar al-Sadiq in Karbala. There is a place known as the Bagh of Imam Jafar al-Sadiq behind maqam sahib al-Zaman. We are told Imam Jafar al-Sadiq came to stay here. And he used to perform the ziyad of Imam Hussein walking from there is the emphasis on walk or is the emphasis on the ziyarat? The emphasis is surely and certainly on the ziyarat. Prior to Saddam Hussein's fall, people didn't walk because it was hostile, they were not allowed, they would be killed if they walked and all that. Since he has gone, uh, some people who had dreams have started to walk and now it has actually become a huge thing and everybody is doing it. Alhamdulillah, as long as they are doing it with ma'rifah, then it's fine. But, uh, but it doesn't mean that the person who is not walking and only going to perform the ziyarat of Imam Hussein by car, that his sawab is going to be any less than those who have walked. Yeah. How many bites are there? I have, no, I have not had a chance to walk myself. Those who have, uh, do you know the distance? 80 kilometers. 80 kilometers? 70 kilometers, yeah. 70 kilometers. Takes two and a half days, I think. 
जी या सो पीपल पीपल आर यूजिंग पीपल आर यूजिंग ट्रेड मील्स अ मंथ इन एडवांस एंड वॉकिंग so the summary of the question is that when you say that you need to contemplate and enter the haram of imam ali salam so that you can hear the alaykum salam from the imam what is it that i need to do to be able to hear that alaykum salam in my position or in our position who just go and perform the ziyarat uh, how would we listen to the voice of the imam is that is that correct right yeah is is that is that summary correct yes yeah okay so <clears throat> <coughs> contemplation is a second stage purification is the first so when you are contemplating when people are contemplating they are not contemplating on the personality of imam as to who he was what he did initially their contemplation is upon themselves as to why they are there and i mentioned the story of fitrus of how sick i feel within myself how ill i am spiritually how how this this within myself i feel totally 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 unworthy of being able to perform this so this contemplation first requires as to why i feel unworthy what is it that is making me feel unworthy i need certain purifications for example purification of my heart my thought process need to be purified my my habits need to be purified i need to make sure that i do not do certain things that were disapproved or disliked by my imam what are those things that my imam would never accept from me i need to eliminate those things i need to give him this promise i need to prepare myself so those contemplations will purify the the spiritual aspect within the human being once you co- contemplate on those things from before not only outside the haram not only it's it's a continuing continuous process as you intend to perform the ziyarat is to what you are going to do there what is the purpose it's not just a trend i am going there for a reason i'm not just spending money and working all this for a, for a purpose i'm going there for a huge reason what is this reason and what do i need to do so you will realize that i need to become for example i i'm talking about myself now i need to become a good human being i need to eliminate uh, hypocrisy from my life i need to eliminate the riba from my life i need to eliminate uh, the, i want my imam to be proud of me what is it that will make my imam proud of me that will allow me to look within myself and eliminate those things which prevent me from being a worthy servant of my imam and once i feel that i have done my bit and i have tried my utmost best then contemplate on who i am going to and what i am going to ask from him and then when you sit there in contemplation and watch people you will see the response to the people maybe not to you initially you will see that people are receiving responses maybe not here when i say hear the voice uh, it is not like me saying or at least i feel that way it's not like me saying riyas alaikum salam no it is the response of the soul so 
So when your soul is not in your body and it is connected with the soul of the rest of the zawar, you hear the interaction of these souls. You hear these souls talking. It's not your ear that hears it now. It is your soul that is hearing it. But for soul to hear it, it needs you need to remove the rust from it by purification of that soul. And that once the rust is removed, then you rise to a higher level of the understanding of what the ziyarat is all about. Yeah. Okay, so I have a question from the ladies. Um, the question, and uh, if you have any questions from the lady side, please ask either Sister Samaya, she can text me, or Sister Samir in the back, she can text me as well. The question is, uh, what advice can you give us as far as what to ask from our master? The best advice or something that I normally try to ask from my master is, oh my master, what is expected of me from you? Uh, and that opens up thousands of questions. Uh, what is expected of me from you, my master? Tell me, somehow communicate with me, what am I supposed to be doing? And, and I think... When you think about that question, you will answer these questions yourself and be inspired by the responses of the Imam Alayhi Another question. <coughs> Sister Sumaya, please come forward. This is a, a, a little bit of a long question. When I went to Ziyarat, I couldn't help but notice children begging on the streets. Can anyone hear, everyone hear me in the back? Yeah? Couldn't help but notice children begging on the streets. And I understand with the barakah of our imams, we have a lot of people going. And there is an economic benefit in there. My question is, what steps have our learned scholars taken to take this money coming in to get the children off the streets to prevent an institutionalized begging to come forth in the future, especially with the children who are poor and need money, but need the government to provide education which may not be present? Maybe it requires good planning and envisioning the children's future. And are there any steps being taken to prevent this in your experience? I am sure, I am sure that the grand scholars who are responsible to reach out in their social responsibilities are doing what they are supposed to do. To what level they are doing it, I am not sure. I, I don't have uh, access to that information myself. But yes, there, is, uh, there are people, there are sick and poor people, and there are masakeen <coughs> and beggars on the streets of Najaf and Karbala and all other places. Um, uh, what system is being employed to eradicate this kind of poverty or to, to bring growth within, within the education system or whatever? I'm sure they are reaching out to them, but to what level I'm not sure. Uh, at all, yeah. And it's, it's more a political question uh, than something that will benefit us. You have a question right here? Yeah. Alaikum salam. Alaikum salam. Alaikum salam. How did the name Ya Aba Abdullah come about and what does it mean? You know, in Arabic language, there is something which is known as kunia. In English, it is translated as epitheth, epithet. In Arabic language, say, my name is Muhammad. Respectfully, they don't call me Muhammad. So if I have a son whose name is Salman, <coughs> then they would call me Abu Salman, the father of Salman. So when they call me, they will tell me Abu Salman. Uh, when, you, when you grow up, what's your name? Miqdad. When you grow up and you call your son, what would you like to call your son? <laughs> Murtaza. So, so when you call your son Murtaza, they won't call you Miqdad. They will tell you, they will call you Abu Murtaba. Ali Asghar's name is Abdullah. The, the little child of Imam Hussein, six month old child of Imam Hussein. His name is Abdullah al radir Abdullah, the one, uh, the, the six-month-old child. So, Imam Hussein is known as Abu Abdullah, the father of Abdullah. That's where the name comes from. 
Okay, that's so when we say Ya Aba Abdullah, we are calling upon the father of Abdullah, who is Imam Hussein. Alaykum salam. If we can go back to the first question from the ladies, I'm not very clear if I understood your answer well. Possible you could uh, elucidate it further, please? Which question is this to do with the poverty? Uh, no, the previous one. Uh, what on, question to ask? What, ask? what to ask? I mean, this what to ask, I, I told you what I would ask for. Uh, it's a very personal thing as to what to ask, what do you want to ask from the Imam. As I said, it is the level of the ziyarat that one is performing. It could be because somebody uh, wants something from Imam. It could be because they want cure to the illness, because they want uh, barakat in their risk. Whatever it is, they would ask that in, in the performance of the ziyarat. What I try to ask from my Imam salam in my contemplation is that, Oh my Master, what is expected of me? I mean, I have come here. It is said that you call upon people. It is said that it is your Labbaik that has brought me here. So here I am, my Master. Labbaik, I am here. What is expected of me? What, what can I do? What is, what do you expect of me that you have called me here to perform this ziyarat? When when I ask this question, um, in the physical realm, I will answer this question myself as I look back into my life. In the spiritual realm, if you are connected soul to soul, you should be able to receive the answer soul to soul. That's what I meant. A related question to that is, uh, so I've been given the opportunity to go to Ziyarat for the first time. I have so much to talk to him and ask him for, but I feel selfish to tell him what is in my heart because what he has gone through. Is it okay to ask or shall we ask on the last day? Or shall, shall it just be contained in the heart and he will know? I think the purpose of communication is, is to be able to relate to the Imam. <clears throat> It is not wrong to ask for your desires from him <coughs> at all. It is just like you sitting next to your mother and crying out to her about your problems and seeking her assistance and her kind hand over you and a few words from her too. Ziyarat is that relationship. Ziyarat doesn't mean just to go Assalamu alaykum ya walitha adam sifwatillah or nuhin nabi illa ibrahim khalilillah No, that is one aspect of it Ziyarat is to be able to connect with my imam to ask him the smallest of the things because I feel that that thing is has a sentimental value to me or to ask for Allah from him please open the way or the path to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for me. Allow me to be able to see God the way you have seen God. You can ask for that. You can ask from Imam Hussein for a house. You can ask from Imam Hussein for, for a husband, for a wife, for a child, for, for anything. And we have riwayat that people have done so. We, uh, we have heard so many stories in the karamat and the miracles of Hussein ibn Ali. You can, you can ask for anything. The purpose is communication with the Imam. There is nothing small in front of the Imam or big. There is no selfish. Uh, it is the, the fact that I am going to meet my Imam in itself is selfish. Even if I want to meet God through the Imam, it is still the selfish reason. So it is, it depends upon the level of ziyarat I am doing. If my level is to talk to my Imam and hold on to to him and say that hold my hand and take me from here to here, fine, that is perfectly okay. It is how you communicate with him. It's communication. It's not important what you ask for. But but when you ask for it, you 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 know that he is someone who is able to influence your supplication or the granting of the of your heartly desire from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So it's not wrong, it's it's not selfish. Uh, to ask what he has gone through. In fact, you may have heard of the story of uh, Allama Hilli uh, before. If not, then I will just quickly 
It's a long story though. Um, have you heard of this woman? I will cut the long story short and this is from Allah Mahili. There was a there was a woman in whose house a, a king went to whose house who was lost on his way and he went to her house and he spent a night there and she had a, sh a goat and she slaughtered and gave it. You know the story. Yeah, all of you know the story. The punchline of that particular story is that when she came to ask for a favor from the king or for assistance from the king, the king inquired from his from his uh, advisors as to what should I give this woman and uh, uh, some said this and some said that eventually the king said none of you have done justice this woman gave me her entire capital it is my responsibility now to give her the entire kingdom that I have so it was the twelfth Imam according to Allah Mahili, it was the twelfth Imam speaking to Allah Mahili who says that Hussein spared nothing to save Islam why should therefore Allah not give his entire will and mashiat in the hands of Hussein ibn Ali so if you need to seek something from him seek it as if you are seeking it from God except don't think that it is he who grants it because that becomes shirk it is he who influences it that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grants it. But Hussein is Hussein. Another question from uh, the ladies. You talked about the purification of the soul. What if there isn't enough time? How can we face our Imam and can we ever truly be purified? Purification con through contemplation is, 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 a, is, a, is an ongoing and continuous movement. But sincerity comes in an instant and sincerity can wipe out the whole rust in an instant moment it is how sincere one is in seeking repentance in wanting to meet in wanting to clear in wanting to clean the rust from one's heart it is the sincerity that is more important than the timing because for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala um, إذا أراد سوري إنما أمره إذا أراد شيئا أن يقول له كن it is for him be and it is how sincere I am in my repentance how sincere I am in seeking how sincere I am in wanting to meet my Imam to talk to him to communicate with him is what is important a question from the gents <coughs> and that's a question I've had also um, Gold and pomp and flashiness of this dunya is not something that the imams wanted. So why are the harams so decorated? It is not the imams that have decorated the harams. It is us that have decorated the harams. It is us that have put gold in them. It is us that have decided to spend money again purely through our own faith and iman and our aqidah on the grand personality of Imam Ali or Imam Hussein or any other Imam for example if you go to the Haram of all the Imams alayhimu salatu wassalam you will see the grand Haram in Mashhad Allahu Akbar those who have been there can appreciate what, what Mashhad of, of Haram is it is bigger than the Haram of Khanai Kaaba it has 11 sahans not one 11 one attached to the other Look at the dome, beautiful. They say that if the economy of Iran fails, they can rely on the gold that is on that dome to run the Iranian uh, government. You go to other harams. You go to the haram of Imam Ali in particular. You know the wall, the entrance wall. So when the grave um, is like this, the head is on this side and the feet are on this side. The all the the golden walls of the haram of the outside of the haram are on the head side of the imam where the imam is lying towards the head so if the imam is lying inside here this is the entrance this wall is made of gold and the rest of the three walls are ordinary walls but the wall in the haram of imam ali is on the f on the side of his feet 
It is not on the side of his head. And the king, the Safavid king who made it, has written, if you go there, uh, try to look for it. He has written that to Ali, gold was the dust of his feet. And that's why I have placed this golden wall by the feet of Ali ibn Abi Talib. It was his aqidah to put gold there. He wanted to put gold there. Imam himself was somebody who was carrying uh, a bag of flour at 4 o'clock in the morning and delivering to the poor people. So it is nothing to do with the Imam. The decoration is nothing to do with the Imam. The decoration is us. We want the Haram to look beautiful. We want the Haram to look nice. We want... And, and that's what has been placed there. Uh, it is just like somebody doing Matam, expressing his own uh, emotions in a particular way. You can't stop him and teach him that this is not how you express your emotions, how one expresses one's own emotion is something very personal. So the people who actually put gold in there, uh, put gold in there, who belong, who owns Imam Hussein? Nobody owns Imam Hussein. You go to the Julus in Dar es Salaam, in Karachi, in India, in Pakistan, in wherever you go, you see non-Muslims bringing gold and placing it there. Not that they are giving anything to Hussein. Not that Hussein is benefiting anything from it. It is the aqidah of the people who are placing it there. Yes, it is possible for us to use that gold to serve the purpose of Hussein, of what Hussein ibn Ali would do himself. But who makes that decision? And how the, how the, the, the reaction of the Ummah will be if that decision is made only Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows. Yeah. Okay, so it's going to be about an hour. Uh, Sayyid is uh, tired, he hasn't had dinner, so I'm going to try to wrap it up uh, pretty soon here. A couple more questions, we have one uh, on the side. Did you advise on the etiquette of reading and discussing? Sorry, I can't hear you. etiquette of meeting and discussing with the marja. There is no etiquette apart from normal etiquette to go and visit a marja. Um, you will be told by, by um, your scholar or the people who are going with you as to what, so you will be, if you will be going to Zerat, you will, if, you, if it is Iraq, you will be visiting one of the four marja, Ayatollah Sistani. Ayatollah Bashir Najafi, Ayatollah Saeed Al-Hakim, or Ayatollah Ishaq Fayyad. And there are other junior marajah, but these are the top four marajah for visiting. Um, apart from, I don't know, I mean, I, it's, it's just normal visitation to a merger's house. You, you enter, you, will, you, will, you have no chance to do anything. You just are made to sit down respectfully speak to him, talk to him, ask questions, and they respond to you. Yeah. Question over here? Yeah, in the, in, the, in the context of one of the questions asked, uh, and, and I wonder, uh, in terms of I believe complete communication is important when we want to communicate with the man, because if Allah Say correct me here. If the Lord tells us, oh, do me after and you know, ask for something, and I don't just assume or imply in concrete terms, oh, do me after but by the same context, is the same concrete communication not relevant here to the Imam? It is, you see, oh, yeah. oh sorry. <clears throat> Shall I give you the mic? <laughs> uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Quran, Ud'uni astajib lakum. Call upon me and I shall respond. Uh, is that not the, the, the case when it comes to Imam Hussein? Is that right? Yeah, that's, to, me, that, that's an, to me that's a lesson for us. To using the same reasoning. And then asking, no, here Allah is asking us to call upon him. Ud'uni, call upon me, astajib lakum, I shall respond to you. 
the same principle would apply to Imam Hussein except that we must refrain from thinking that he is the agency that we are asking from that he is going to provide for us because that leads us towards shirk uh, according to the Quran itself and therefore the awareness that Imam Hussein alayhi salatu was salam is a personality that has reached a spiritual status whereby I can ask him to intervene on my behalf knowing that it is not he who will provide for me it is Allah who will provide for me but because Allah has placed him as a wasila for me then yes I can directly go and call upon him and he should respond so he is responding but his response is of this nature unless I have not understood your question no you have and I was implying to say that the question I had asked whether I can just be there and assume a few things rather than communicate to the Imam in concrete terms and I was emphasizing the fact that don't just think that what you have in mind the Imam would know it's essential that you communicate in concrete terms. Absolutely, yes. It is necessary to communicate. Absolutely. I agree. I beg your pardon. It is absolutely necessary that you uh, have a concrete communication with the Imam. And that applies, by the way, to the Ariza that we write to the 12th Imam alayhi salatu was salam. What we do is necessary for us to think uh, in terms of our actions as well as to what we do. When an Ariza is given to us, we are told that you read this, you, you write in this Ariza, pen or pencil, whatever you want to use. Then we are told, if you uh, don't know Arabic, then you can write in any other language. Then we are told, you don't actually have to write in any other language, you can scribble. Then we are told, you don't even have to scribble, you can just look at it and put your thoughts in it and send the Ariza. These are only symbolic, by the way. If Imam can understand what you are just looking in the paper, then he does not require a paper to understand you at all. Then your communication with the Imam, these are symbolic issues. It must be a concrete uh, communication with any of the Imams that we are discussing. And only then it is, it, it is fair to expect a response. You cannot just begin assuming things there and, and come out from there. It must be a concrete communication, yes. Okay, so with that, inshallah, we'll, uh, we'll wrap it up. Um, I have a small request. Uh, Sayyid's uh, mother passed away a couple of months ago, so inshallah, if we can all recite Surah Fatiha, you know, Inshallah, the sawab of this gathering can go to her. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahman. Sayyid, I'd like to thank you very much for enlightening us, for spending the extra time. I know you haven't had dinner yet. Uh, inshallah, you know, the Zawaz will benefit from this session. Uh, with that, we'll uh, wrap up with the Ziyarat. Sallallahu alayka ya Aba Abdullah wa ala al-arwah al-lati hallat bi fanaika alayka minni jami'an salamullahi abadan ma baqeet وبقي الليل والنهار ولا جعله الله آخر العهد مني لزيارتكم السلام على الحسين وعلى علي بن الحسين وعلى أولاد الحسين وعلى أصحاب الحسين جميعا ورحمة الله وبركاته السلام عليك يا غريب الغرب وبعيد المدى السلطان بالحسن علي بن موسى الرضا سلام الله عليك وعلى آبائك الطاهرين وأبنائك المعصومين وعلى أختك فاطمة المعصومة جميعا ورحمة الله وبركاته
السلام عليك يا حجة الله يا ابن الحسن يا صاحب الأمل والعصر والزمان السلام عليك يا خليفة الرحمن السلام عليك يا شريك القرآن السلام عليك يا كعبة الإيمان السلام عليك يا إمامنا وإمام الإنس والجان عجل الله لك ما وعدك من الناصر وظهور الأمر ورحمة الله وبركاته